Wayfarer's Chapel is a national memorial to Emanuel Swedenborg and an ecumenical ministry of the Swedenborgian Church based here in Rancho Palos Verdes, California. We seek to nurture the spiritual journey of all wayfarers traveling through life. Our podcast features our weekly sermon and scripture readings. Enjoy. The uh, Hebrew Bible reading this morning is from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 to 2 and 6 to 14. It says, Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and then to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You've asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, then it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see them, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he went back and he stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he struck the water, the water was parted to one side and then to the other, and Elisha went over. Psalm 16 reads, Protect me, O God, for, you, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another god multiply their sorrows. They drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to shale or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. From the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 to 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, 
They said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But if for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. From the writings of the Christian mystic Emanuel Swedenborg, Secrets of Heaven, number 5895. Jesus said, no man putting his hand to the plow but looking backward is fit for the kingdom of God. Thus, he who puts his hand to the plow is he who is in good, but looking backward is he who then looks back to the doctrinal things of faith and thus forsakes good. It was on this account that Elijah was displeased that Elisha, who was plowing in the field when called, asked that he might first kiss his father and mother. For Elijah said, Go, return, for what have I done to thee? Now may the Lord add blessing unto the reading, hearing, and living out of these holy words. Amen. A man is robbing a house. Once he breaks through the window and starts stealing items, he heard a parrot say, Jesus is watching you. Jesus is watching you. The man ignores it, moves on. The parrot starts speaking again. Jesus is watching you. Jesus is watching you. The man turns around and says to the parrot, what kind of man has a parrot that says Jesus is watching you? The parrot replies, the same man who has a Doberman named Jesus. (laughs) So we have a lot to cover today in terms of digging and plumbing the depths for some spiritual insights and getting back to this topic of the work of remaining spiritually centered and grounded, anchored in God. Sounds nice. It sounds like a great thing to be in the world and do, and we all hopefully strive for some level of that, that marriage of divine love with divine wisdom as the true nature of God. So we're all very familiar with kind of the goal that we're seeking. And yet... Part of what I want to dig in today is some of those spiritual analogies that are also connected to doing really hard physical labor in the world. And we all are, I'm I'm sure, familiar with what it takes um, to go out there and and do hard work. I mean, just simply keeping up a household, doing chores, um, all the ways that uh, it can, you know, I, I think... Reflecting on my own experiences in this is, um, you know, some of the most rewarding times of getting a good night's rest and uh, just the end of the day just feeling so physically exhausted. You've laid it on the line, whether it's in sports, whether it's, you know, just cleaning up uh, the garage or, you know, whatever it is. You've put a lot of effort in. You're reaping the rewards, but you are physically exhausted by the labor. There's a way to apply that in our spiritual lives as well. And I'm going to read uh, to you from a book that's been very influential in my life, and I know many others since it's been a a bestseller for decades at this point. Um, 
Eckhart Tolle. He, he wrote The Power of Now and that got published in 1999 and then A New Earth in 2004. He's only written two books. Well, those are pretty profound books. And, well, I guess he's, he's written some uh, kind of one-offs, uh, but those are the main uh, master works that he's done. In order to have a satisfying and fulfilling life, we always need to keep in balance, you know, not only the things that we do out there in the world, physically and, and uh, mentally and spiritually, and all the, all the ways that we are either, you know, preparing to, to enter the workforce, doing, being in the workforce, or, you know, having an active, fulfilling uh, post-workforce uh, life and retirement. And there's a balance between efforting and doing, and the counterbalance to that which is not talked about so much is our spiritual nature, which is usually covered up by all those things that we're constantly distracted by. Our being is how he describes it. And he explicitly states this as the more common phenomenon out in the world. And I think it's a fair, fairly rare exception to this rule where people succeed on the interior level. They know who they are. They're enlightened. Uh, and yet the world would see them as, quote unquote, losers or, you know, not having achieved much. But I think it's fair to say we know more probably in our own personal experience that the opposite of that is the more likely scenario. In other words, to gain the world and lose our soul. Now, this concept gets at some deeper spiritual insights that Jesus spoke so that all of us who are going to follow after him could refer to and not get lost into what these spiritually pointed to. I think it's fair to say that a lot of some of the more um, obscure, abstract uh, parables out there are the ones that are probably the more profound and yet we just kind of gloss over them, and maybe the, the people even recording and uh, documenting this didn't quite get the, the spiritual depth of what Jesus was speaking at the time. So this excerpt is called, subtitled, um, Stop Waiting for Life. And this is by Tolley. Gratitude for the present moment and the fullness of life now is... True prosperity. Are you a habitual waiter? How much of your life do you spend waiting? What I call small-scale waiting is waiting in line at the post office, in a traffic jam at the airport, or waiting for someone to arrive, to finish work, and so on. Large-scale waiting is waiting for the next vacation, for a better job, for the children to grow up, for a truly meaningful relationship, for success, to make money, to be important, to become enlightened. It is not uncommon for people to spend their whole life waiting to start living. Waiting is a state of mind. Basically, it means that you want the future. You don't want the present. You don't want what you've got, and you want what you haven't got. With every kind of waiting, you unconsciously create inner conflict between your here and now, where you don't want to be, and the projected future, where you want to be. This greatly reduces the quality of your life by making you lose the present. There is nothing wrong with striving to improve your life situation. You can improve your life situation, but you cannot improve your life. Life is primary. Life is your deepest inner being. It is already whole, complete, perfect. Your life situation consists of your circumstances and experiences. There is nothing wrong with setting goals and striving to achieve things. The mistake lies in using it as a substitute for the feeling of life, for being. The only point of access for that is the now. You are then like an architect who pays no attention to the foundation of a building but spends a lot of time working on the superstructure. When you catch yourself slipping into waiting, snap out of it. Come into the present moment, just be and enjoy being. 
For example, many people are waiting for prosperity. It cannot come in the future. When you honor, acknowledge, and fully accept your present reality, where you are, who you are, what you are doing right now, when you fully accept what you have got, you are grateful for what you have got, grateful for what is, grateful for being. Gratitude for the present moment and the fullness of life now is true prosperity. It cannot come in the future. Then, in time, that prosperity manifests for you in various ways. If you are dissatisfied with what you have got, or even frustrated or angry about your present lack, that may motivate you to become rich. But even if you do make millions, you will continue to experience the inner condition of lack. And deep down, you will continue to feel unfulfilled. You may have many exciting experiences that money can buy, but they will come and go and always leave you with an empty feeling and the need for further physical or psychological gratification. You won't abide in being and so feel the fullness of life now that alone is true prosperity. So give up waiting as a state of mind. When you catch yourself slipping into waiting, snap out of it. Come into the present moment. Just be and enjoy being. If you are present, there is never any need for you to, to, to wait for anything. So the next time someone says, sorry to have kept you waiting, you can reply, that's all right. I wasn't waiting. I was just standing here enjoying myself. Enjoy in myself. So there's a lot of spiritual wisdom and insight in what I just read. And the greater challenge is to actually apply that in our life so it moves from the theoretical to the experiential where we actually feel that, that connection to this moment, to that joy that isn't caused by some external force out there. It isn't fleeting. It isn't like we just won the lottery and then we suddenly feel excited or our sports team just won, so we're going to feel excited for a few moments. It's a much deeper, more profound experience that has to do with, really, allowing our true nature to shine forth in the world. And so taking that insight, I want to apply it to some of the scripture because it does unpack and unlock a whole lot that is there in the Bible and yet gets glossed over so frequently. In our first scripture reading this morning with Elisha and Elijah, I recently did a sermon that addressed some of that, and I'm going to kind of cut to the chase on what's really important in terms of this lesson applied to this reading from the Old Testament. So if you look at it with spiritual eyes and ears that are open, this same theme of remaining present at the moment is there in the Old Testament story from 2 Kings. These relationships can be found throughout time and throughout various religious traditions from east to west. The theme also finds itself even in modern versions of, of storytelling, including Star Wars. The Jedi Knights, they pair up. There's always the master, the Padawan. Someone is learning. And they're all trying to do the same theme, whether it's resting in the presence of God, whether it's using the force. It's a gift of surrendering to what is that is ultimately more powerful. And this is shining through even here in the story of Elijah and Elisha. This teaching is happening, and it's also paralleled in the New Testament scripture as well, where Elijah is about to leave the earth. All the wisdom that he is trying to pass on in the East, sometimes that's called Shaktipat. There's a transmission of spiritual wisdom and energy that once you get it, well, you can't go back. You've got it. And this is in the patriarchs in, in Buddhism. It applies in apostolic succession here in the Christian tradition. And all around the world, you see kind of spiritual wisdom and lineages and the transmission of what is the depth of your teaching. Once you've got it, 
how do you, how do you transmit that wisdom, that knowledge, that divine love, that divine wisdom? We get a close, critical example of this in this exchange that was just read this morning. Just before Elijah is taken up in the chariots of fire with a flaming chariot and the horses and this big dramatic ascension back to the heavenly realm. Elijah knows that the time has come. And there's one final lesson to dispense to his student. That transmission of spiritual power. The final lesson. And if you look for it closely, it's close attention to whatever is happening in this moment. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken up from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. So there it is. A true spiritual master is giving a lesson in that final moment where there's no longer going to be time here on earth to have a second chance. And it's wrapped in an even deeper lesson. All those time, all those years, all the journey here on earth boils down to this sacred moment a potential for inheriting a double portion, or not at all. In summary, it's a test. A test to determine if Elisha has learned the essence of what his master had been teaching him all these years. If Elisha were to miss this moment, his years spent were for naught. The lessons will not transmit if this test is not passed. Lucky for us all, Elisha passes this final test. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen down from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water parted to one side and to the other. And Elisha went over. So we have some confirmation, and it's, you know, it's a great piece of what's happening in this reading of the story, where Elijah, at the beginning of the story, he's the one with the mantle, parts the water, leads Elisha, and then, yes, Elijah gets taken away into heaven. The mantle drops to the ground, Elisha sees that, picks it up, and is able to perform the exact same thing that Elijah just did, the parting of the water. There's continuity. Elisha had passed the test. The success of the transmission had taken place. So I want to kind of underscore the spiritual immediacy that also is transcendent. Christian mystic Emanuel Swedenborg understood this dynamic when he wrote in Arcana Celestia, Secrets of Heaven, regarding both the teaching on this inner meaning There are spiritual interiors, that putting the hand of the plow means more than just physical labor, means something deeply spiritual. This was read from Secrets of Heaven 5895. Jesus said, "No, no man putting his hand to the plow but looking backward is fit for the kingdom of God. Thus he who puts his hand to the plow is he who is in the good, but looking backward is he who then looks to the doctrinal things of faith and thus forsakes good. It was on this account that Elijah was displeased with Elisha, who was plowing in the field when called, asked that he might first kiss his father and mother, for Elijah said, Go, return, for what have I done to thee? So here we have some interesting connections, not only with the Old Testament, with what the observations of Swedenborg are, but we are now ready to kind of plumb the depths of what we learned in our New Testament scripture reading where Jesus says some things which on the surface seem kind of harsh. 
but at the deeper level make perfect sense. There's a spiritual paradox here. It's hard work. It is challenging to be that focused in this moment so that everything, listening to the surroundings, paying close attention to these critical moments which have lasting consequences, are all present. It's part of the reason why we're drawn and as a species to extreme sports, the X Games, NASCAR, if you're trying, uh, the, the documentary of, of climbing El Capitan without any ropes. The same thing applies because if at any moment our focus is not completely there, we're going to die. It means instant death. That is the level of getting access to the spiritual dimension, which is so challenging that people do this with that same sensibility. If I don't accomplish this, my complete attention is not here. If I don't make this move, if I don't pass this person, it's death. But that's what drives us to this spiritual level that many of these people don't, may not see that as spiritual. But guess what? If you're open to this, and you're following this far, you haven't run out, the good news for all of us is you don't have to climb the Iger. You don't have to do extreme sports in order to access the same joy of being. That's the hard work. That's the challenge of being so focused in the here and now that that becomes the good. That becomes the truth. And that's the other level of putting hands to the plow and not looking back. You notice that Swedenborg talks about if you're focused on the good, the doctrinal stuff, the looking and second guessing is what the distraction is. If you know it, you feel it. You're connected. So it's now easier to see the parallels and not only what was there in the Old Testament, but moving into this scripture from, that we captured in Luke 9. Jesus also explains this. If we pay special attention with kind of what I'm impacted and looking at with spiritual eyes, Jesus was on a mission and nothing was going to stop him. I mean, so much that if you look, if you read that critically, I always, I thought the language was pretty fascinating. His face was set on Jerusalem. It's just, you kind of get this image where you're just like a man on a mission to such degree that what happens is his disciples are getting wrapped up in this. People aren't recognizing who Jesus is. They're getting a little enraged that people aren't getting it. And they want to bring some hellfire down on him. Let me wrap this up here and reread that one section. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first, let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. Now on the surface, that sounds pretty harsh. On another spiritual level, which is kind of what I've been preaching about today, if you're accessing another dimension that is deeply spiritual, that is present in this eternal moment of the now, underneath that is something that is at the core of what is also there in that moment of transmission from Elijah to Elisha. It's here a teaching that becomes a parable of Jesus for anyone who's going to be a follower. And there's also another thing that I've considered in that phrase as well, which is perhaps there is a whole other dimension and layer to those phrases and words that Jesus is speaking, which is all of those distractions. If you're going to be continuing to focus on that, they're going to get you away from what I'm trying to teach everyone, entering into this narrow gateway. I've also considered that perhaps Jesus was referring to the spiritually dead, not the physically that those who are spiritually dead can deal with them their, their own. If you're going to be awake and alive and doing something in my kingdom, you've got to be paying attention closely. You've got to be alert to whatever the whispering of the Holy Spirit is saying. That's where you access divinity. That's what I've been trying to teach 
for all these years. We don't need to go too far from this to just observe how the world continues to operate. Some of us continue to feel overwhelmed by what I call the spiritual unconsciousness that is out there permeates everything in our lives. This tendency to come back, to be spiritually alive and awakened and paying close attention to whatever is happening. That's the secret sauce. That's where it's at. So I'll conclude with that last piece of scripture. Another said, I will follow you. I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. So just a little bit more set up. And it's those moments in life where perhaps we're on the verge of something that is a critical breakthrough, and yet we're saying to the Lord, yes, but not right now. Hold on. Wait up. Let, let me do these other things over here, and then I'll come back to you. No. The deeper lesson is always entering more fully into this moment that is already existing, moving deeper into that space. Like I was talking about earlier, that uncaused joy. It's hard work because it's so unfamiliar to the way the world works. In fact, we might even catch ourselves a little bit like, wait a second, I'm feeling some joy. What's wrong? Hold on here. Wait a second. I'm more familiar with this over here, this outdated version of of things, but it's more socially acceptable. So this is what I find in plumbing the depths of our scripture readings this morning as the essence of lived spirituality that you can connect with at a deeper level of our being, where Jesus says to him in response to that, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. When we, too, access this same lived experiential connection of this moment, where nothing could possibly add to what we're feeling, we're also joining with Jesus in living out and following the Lord into this eternal kingdom. We're remaining spiritually present. We're doing that hard work of putting our hands to the plow and remaining in the light of Christ. May the Lord so help us all. Amen.